One of the big challenges that we're facing is Alzheimer's disease. It affects one in five people between the ages of 75 and 84, and almost half of us by age 85. And it starts pretty insidiously. The words start escaping you, and I, I don't have to tell you that as it goes along, it can really be a pretty tragic thing. But there's some good news. Certain steps seem to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's a little bit too soon to know for sure if this is a preventive, but let me share with you what research is showing. First thing is when people follow a healthy plant-based diet, it seems to really help them. The grains and the beans and the vegetables and fruits help us, first of all, by slimming you down. Slimmer people have a lot less risk of Alzheimer's disease. But the second thing is that when you follow this kind of diet, your cholesterol falls, and we've been learning that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. People who have a lower cholesterol level have less risk of Alzheimer's disease. So let me also cheerlead for one group of foods in particular, the green leafy vegetables. You know what I'm talking about, spinach and Brussels sprouts and kale and collard greens. They have vitamin C, they've got vitamin E, they have folate, which is a B vitamin. All of these are linked to lower risk. Now, these same dark green leafy vegetables have natural compounds that help prevent the age-related visual loss. Do you know about macular degeneration? It's so common, but people who eat their leafy greens have less risk as well. So the more we include these healthy vegetables in our routine, the better. So plant-based diet for Alzheimer's disease, but one other thing, aluminum. When pathologists do autopsies and they look in the brain of people who have died with Alzheimer's disease, they often find traces of aluminum. Now, it's controversial, but I recommend that we err on the side of caution. Where are we getting aluminum? If you have an aluminum cookware that is not coated, some of the aluminum can come through in your spaghetti sauce. Or if you're taking antacids, look at the labels. Some of them don't have aluminum. Some of them do. So it's very easy to avoid it and keep it out of your diet. All right? So in summary, plant-based diet is good. Avoiding extra aluminum is a really good idea. This can help us prevent Alzheimer's disease. Now, perhaps the biggest surprise of our research is when pain melts away. It turns out certain foods can actually trigger arthritis. The most common one is dairy products, and some people will get away from dairy products for their cholesterol or for their diabetes or their blood pressure or whatever, and they discover that their joints are improving. Now, there are other triggers as well. It could be wheat or it could be eggs or something. And in research studies, not everybody benefits from a diet change, but some people do. And it is such a wonderful thing when that pain melts away, when you can open up a jar again or you can shake somebody's hand without fear. Let me share with you the story of Irene, a young woman who's living in Richmond, Virginia. Really just walking was very difficult. I, my hips were killing me, my elbows. I mean, I couldn't pick up my daughter. I just couldn't do the things that um, but I wanted to do. My life was kind of just going away from me. So I started on, the, on prednisone, then I went to mexotrexate, and I wasn't feeling any better. I was still feeling pretty sick. And that's when I started to kind of explore on the internet and start looking to think, you know, what, what else is out there? You know, I really wanted to try the, um, the vegan diet completely on its own. And uh, I went to my rheumatologist and at that time, he was really, um, he wasn't supportive. He was just kind of like, you're insane. <laughs> and then, um, and I, and, but you know, I was feeling better. I mean, the minute, you know, you can be pain free, uh, it just gives you a whole other outlook on life. You wouldn't believe that food can make that type of a difference in your life and the right food, and um, it does. It's been, almost seven years, because my daughter's almost eight, and I am very thankful. Um, I have my life back, and um, I'm having a good life. <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful for, um, for what I have. Research studies show that about half of people who make diet changes have a significant improvement in their arthritis, or the arthritis just simply goes away, as we saw with Irene. Same thing with migraines. If any of you have migraine headaches, don't go another day. Set aside the animal products, set aside the oils, and see if your migraines don't improve. The issue is just the same. There are certain foods that trigger the changes that cause pain for a great many people, and you set those foods aside, pain no longer comes. Don't take any of this on faith. The whole idea of the Kickstart program is you make a very short three-week experience of essentially a perfect diet, and then you see what it'll do for you. You see how easy this is? We're emphasizing the healthy foods from the plant kingdom. We're steering clear of the fatty foods, and the payoff is huge. Your weight starts coming down on its own. 
narrowed arteries reopen, your blood pressure improves, diabetes gets better, you might even reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, pains finally leave you alone. Now, you may live longer, you're going to live better, but what if you're stuck on something? Maybe something like sugar or chocolate or whatever, and you think, I'd like to change, but I don't know quite how. Well, when we come back, we're going to find out what these foods are doing to us and how to break free. Stay with us. Well, by now you might be thinking, well, I'll believe it. If I ate better, I'd probably be healthier. But Dr. Barnard, sugar calls my name. Chocolate knows where I live. Is this sounding familiar? Well, let me tell you something. This is not a sign of a moral failing. This doesn't mean you had a bad upbringing. It does not mean that you're a glutton. Let me show you what's actually going on with cravings and how to deal with it. First of all, how to magnetize a baby. You start with a baby. The baby should be 9 to 12 weeks of age, and you sit face to face, 15 inches apart. And you take one teaspoon of sugar, one cup of water, mix it together, put the baby's pacifier in the sugar water, and put it in the baby's mouth. Set a timer for three and a half minutes, maintain eye contact the whole time. When the timer goes off, stop. The baby is now magnetized. Go out of the room, wait 20 minutes, come back in with about a dozen other people, and what you discover is the baby is paying attention to no one except for you. The baby looks at you and coos and gurgles and throws you a seductive shoulder. The baby loves you. By the way, this doesn't have to be your baby. <laughs> Grandparents have been doing this for quite a long period of time. Here's what's going on. The taste of sugar on the tongue triggers the release of opiates within the brain. And that is occurring while the baby is looking at your face. This is a real experiment that was done at the University of Massachusetts, and they showed that this occurs very, very quickly. Sugar on the tongue triggers the release of opiates in the brain. You know about the runner's high, the endorphins? Well, they're in the brain just waiting to be triggered, and sugar does that. When the opiates are released in the brain, they in turn trigger the release of dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical. And while the baby was looking at your face, the pleasure came out, and now the baby remembers you very fondly. Hospital personnel have been taking advantage of this very same phenomenon. If they're going to do a heel stick on a newborn, you know, to, to draw a blood sample, they'll often dri dribble a little sugar water in the baby's mouth, and the baby cries less. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but that opiate effect is a little bit of a painkiller. Unless mom was a heroin addict. In that case, it doesn't have any effect at all. Now, why would that be? Any ideas? Well, the baby's been bathing in opiates for nine months, so that little bit of sugar water has no effect. Now, we are not babies. Sugar water is not our thing anymore, but anybody here crave sugary foods? Or find this? Absolutely. And it's not just sugar. Chocolate. Anybody here like chocolate? Well, in 1992, researchers at the University of Michigan did an interesting experiment. They used an opiate-blocking drug, and they gave it not to heroin addicts, but to sugar addicts, if I can say that. The drug is called naloxone. It's normally used when a guy is shooting up heroin on the street. He misjudges his dose. He gets a little bit too much and he gets wobbly. Then he falls face down in the gutter. His friends know exactly what's going to happen, which is he's going to die. And so they bring him into the operating room and we take naloxone, suck it up into a syringe, jam it into his vein. It goes to his brain and it stops the heroin from affecting the brain. He wakes up. You've saved his life. Well, what if we give this to a person who's binging on chocolate. The most amazing thing happens. You can give them a tray of candy bars, and what you discover is it just kind of stays on the tray. They'll have a taste, they just set it back down. Have some more. No, I, I'll have some later. The point being that when I block the opiate effect of the brain, a lot of the desire for chocolate is gone. By the way, this is not a treatment. Um, <laughs> I, I'd have to go with you to the convenience store with an IV hookup. It's over. Um, this is a research tool that shows that it's not just taste and mouthfeel. There's something actually going on in the brain. Is this making sense? And doesn't this start to explain why it is that we crave certain things and not others? I mean, nobody ever went to a convenience store at 9 o'clock at night to buy cauliflower. <laughs> and we didn't go there to get peaches or things like that. I mean, we might like the taste of a crisp apple on a hot summer day, but we don't crave it. We don't binge on it. We want sugar. We want chocolate. Nobody ever said, I'm so mad. 
I'm going to go steam some green beans. No, no, no. I'm feeling so lonely, so I'll make lentil loaf. No, we don't do that. We want junk. And the very same part of the brain that is affected by relationships with other people and intimacy is what is hijacked by these foods. And that's why we think of these foods as our friends. But you know what? Chocolate and sugar are false friends. They trigger that. We get, tend to get hooked, and we want them during times of stress. But what are they doing to us? Well, when you look at the scale, you see the results. And it's not just chocolate and sugar. It's cheese for some people. And for a lot of guys, it's meat. The cardiologist might say, Hank, you've had a heart attack. We really need to set it aside. And he might say, I'd rather die than give up my grill. You know what I'm saying. Well, this sounds an awful lot like addictive behavior. And I think the truth is, whether we talk about addictions or not, there's something about these foods that really does get us hooked. And when we look at what has happened over the decades, it's really remarkable about the food changes that have come in. In the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, my research team tracked the diet changes that have been going on ever since 1909 when the US government started tracking. And you know what we've seen? The average American is eating 75 pounds more meat per person per year than they did back a century ago. About 30 pounds more cheese per person per year, and I'm not eating any, somebody else is getting mine. <laughs> and about 30 pounds or so extra sugar. Where are we putting 75 pounds of meat, 30 pounds of cheese, 30 pounds of sugar, every person every year? We're putting it on our waistline. We're putting it on our thighs. So what do we do? The answer is not to decide to give up any food forever. Rather, let's take a vacation. Let's just get a clean break. Because, is this not true? We crave today what we had yesterday, often right around the same time. If you haven't had chocolate for six weeks or so, it's not calling your name quite so loudly. But if you had it yesterday, we want it today. And that's what the Kickstart's all about. It gets you out of your rut. It puts you back in charge. It puts your focus back on the healthy foods. Let me share a handy tool that's really going to help you. It's called the glycemic index. And what it means is, if you're monitoring how much sugar is in your blood from day to day, it's a roller coaster that's affected by foods. And cravings kick in when your blood sugar is falling. When your blood sugar is really low, you're ready to eat the sofa. Well, certain foods have different kinds of effects on your blood sugar. Let's say, for example, I have white bread. White bread makes my blood sugar go up, and then it's coming down, and as it's falling, that's when the cravings kick in. So the glycemic index helps us out. It was invented in 1981 by Dr. David Jenkins, who I mentioned earlier, the University of Toronto. And what he showed is that there are only really certain foods that you're going to want to think about. Sugar itself, what will that do to your blood sugar? Up it goes, and then when it starts coming down, the cravings kick in. Instead, have fruit. Tastes sweet, but it has less effect on your blood sugar. How about white bread? raises your blood sugar, rye and pumpernickel, much less effect. Big white baking potatoes, unfortunately, they tend to cause the blood sugar to rise, but sweet potatoes, yams, for whatever reason, they're much more gentle on your blood sugar. Cold cereals, most of them are high, except for bran cereals and a few others, but oatmeal, nice, low effect on your blood sugar, very gentle. And the foods to really emphasize, beans, peas, lentils, most of the fruits, even pasta, surprisingly enough, yes, it's made with white flour, but it's dense enough that it digests slowly and won't, re won't really spike your blood sugar very much. All of the green, yellow, and orange vegetables, perfectly fine. They have very little effect on your blood sugar. 